Okay. Well, I'll just kick off by welcoming you all and uh, lovely to see you all. And uh, particularly welcome Karen Ross, who, as you will have read by all the blurb, is Professor of Gender and Media at Newcastle University, uh, the School of Arts and Culture. Um, and her presentation is going to be about gendered ageism in the news industry, uh, which leads to a lot more airing. And uh, she's been prompted to carry out this because there's so little um, in the public domain about it. So we'll be hearing some new stuff and hopefully will give us some pointers on um, maybe what we can do about the situation. So Karen, over to you. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, well, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see uh, so many. I can't, I can't believe we've got 57 participants. But if, if I had this kind of turnout for my lectures, I, I would be such a happy bunny. So yeah, thank, thanks very much for, for your interest. Um, just to say that there, there could be a little bit of background noise. I have a young dog. She's currently chewing on something which I've given her to occupy her for the next hour. But she also likes going, trying to go outside and shout at the pigeons. So I've left the door open. So I'm now freezing, but at least I won't have to be getting up and down, letting, letting her out. Um, so let me just, um, I'm going to just share my screen. I've uh, done, uh, I'm just basically going to talk about 25 minutes um, about the research I've been doing and provide a little bit of context at the beginning. So I'm going to share my screen now. which I hope you can all see. Someone just say yeah. that, yeah, Jenny, you're, you're nodding, so that, that's yeah. great. Um, so I, I got to um, thinking and doing this work uh, because of, of various things I've been doing. Sorry, I'm just gonna stop my timer. Uh, various things I've been doing um, over the past three decades, looking at aspects of gender, um, media, um, and, and news, really and thinking about how women are or are not rep both represented in, kind of in media discourse, but particularly kind of around kind of news and, and, and factual media, as well as who is actually um, writing these stories, who's kind of producing this, this material. And this, this piece of work that I'm gonna talk about is the latest in a series of studies I've undertaken that looks at that relationship between gender and media. And and I, it won't come as most of you will know uh, Miriam O'Reilly's kind of um, experience. So in, in 2011, Miriam O'Reilly won the first UK tribunal case on ageism, which she brought against the BBC when her contract was summarily terminated in 2008. Then in February 2022, last year, Donna Trainer started legal proceedings against the BBC on the grounds of sexism and ageism. Now, while the circumstances of these two cases were very different, the substance was the same. The gendered ageism was at the base of decisions to either dismiss them in O'Reilly's case or move them out of their existing presenting role in Trainer's case. In O'Reilly's case, her contract, along with those of the other four women presenters, but crucially not the men, of um, the BBC TV show Country File was not renewed in 2008. She subsequently took her case uh, to a tribunal, as many of you know, on the grounds of sexism and ageism. She was 53 at the time. And 2011 was awarded, what was an estimated 150,000 uh, pounds in compensation, although only the ageism claim was actually upheld. And that's actually something which is an experience of other women who've also taken uh, tribunal cases. Uh, both in the UK and the US, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. And interestingly, with, with Miriam O'Reilly, quite differently to some of the other women who I've spoken to as part of the study, although at the time the BBC had offered her a compensatory award, um, thought to be considerably less than what she was actually awarded, had background noise, so if everyone could mute themselves, that would be great. Um, so although the BBC had offered her um, an award, a compensatory award, um, at the beginning of her claim, the deal was that she would have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, um, and she wanted her case to have a public airing. Now, many of the women who I talk, talked to who had also brought tribunal cases did actually um, 
sign an NDA. So, which, which is interesting. I think that Miriam O'Reilly was actually rather brave in, in doing that because it could, have, it could have gone either way, although she obviously had a very strong case. And interestingly, after the judgment had been made, BBC made an official statement, an apology to her, acknowledging that it had not got it right um, in this case. So I'm just trying to move my, just try and move that forward. Yeah. So this is what um, the BBC said in terms of uh, accepting, you know, their wrongdoing. But as Miriam O'Reilly herself said very recently, the, you know, she she did lose her, uh, she, she, she gained uh, financially and she got a lot of airtime for her case. But as she's saying, I lost my career. And this is something, this idea of losing career and losing a sense of self is something which many women actually talked about. Uh, as something which couldn't be, cannot be regained. Now, this was in 20, 2011 her, that her, she won her case. And as I said, Donna Trainer brought a case last year. And in 2019, five women anchors working at NY1, which is a prominent local US news channel, sued the network on grounds of age and gender discrimination. And their lawyer said that uh, TV stations in the US and presumably elsewhere regularly fire women because of their age, often using coded language such as needing fresh talent or staff who pop. And again, that comment is something which many women who I spoke to also mentioned. This, this idea that women have a, you know, women, not men, but women have a sell-by date uh, who, who work in the media. So in the findings from the, the study, which I'm going to discuss in a moment, I interviewed 24 women who have worked or still work in different parts of the media industry as journalists, actors, presenters, filmmakers and producers to explore how, how and if their working lives changed as they got older within their particular professions. And crucially, I wanted to know if Miriam O'Reilly's um, landmark judgment of age discrimination and Donna Trainer's ongoing case were minority, albeit devastating experiences, or if they represent the public tip of a much larger iceberg which also includes the many micro discriminations and instances of professional undermining that many older women experience, not just in the media, but basically across, you know, across all professions. And as I will argue, the answer is a very loud yes. So I'm now gonna just talk about my own work in this area. Um, and as I mentioned, I interviewed 24 women for this study, but I'm actually going to just um, focus on the responses from the 16 women journalists who I spoke to, um, because that seems more appropriate for this particular audience. Um, all of the interviews took place on Zoom, except for one which was on uh, WhatsApp video. All the interviews were recorded and a link to the recordings were sent to, to everyone with an invitation to download their own, um, that their own uh, download if they, if they wanted to have their own copy of the recording. I then listened to each interview, wrote a short profile and included three or four quotes, uh, which I thought I might use um, in, in the kind of the, the writing up of the research. I then sent the profile and the quotes to, to everyone who participated, if people were happy to have their comments attributed or if they wanted them anonymized. And in most cases, women were very happy to uh, have their comments attributed. And in the few examples where cases where that didn't happen, it was either because women were, all, were, were still working, either in the, the media industry generally as, as journalists uh, or as freelancers, or where they were actually working for the same broadcaster or the same media um, outlet. So obviously they wanted their, their comments either withdrawn, which is what happened in, in in four cases or anonymized. But in the end, I decided that I was actually going to exclude everyone who had expressed some concern because that seemed to me to be a more kind of ethical way to, to proceed. So the quotes that I'm going to include in, in the rest of the presentation are from women. I mean, haven't they, I've only used their first names, but everyone has actually agreed for these comments to be attributed to them. So, 
I think that one of the issues for me and for you know for some of the participants is having agreed to be to be interviewed having agreed to have their comments um, included a, a couple of women then kind of retracted their um, their consent which which was absolutely fine because including someone who had had a discussion with their union rep who had advised them against um, having their uh, allowing their con comments to be attributed which again I think is actually fair enough but it also says something about culture of, of some media organizations and some newsrooms and it's completely understandable if people you know women have been very candid in what they said to me and don't want to be um, don't want to be seen to have, have actually said things very negative things about their uh, managers gen generally so thinking about this this sample i'm not suggesting in in uh, at all that this you know what i'm talking about and the kind of comments that women made the themes which which emerged are necessarily representative of, of older women in the media but i certainly would say that they're indicative of the, the, the range of experiences uh, that many women have um, where it, particularly when they continue in their professions um, as older women however we however we define older and in, in you know in, in some cases women's experiences of ageism actually start when they're in their their 40s and yeah I'm now in my mid 60s I still don't think of myself as an older person um, I'm sure other people, other people think of me as an older person but I don't think of myself as an older person and I think what, what's really what came across really forcibly was the variation in terms of when other people decide when media managers or you know editors decide that, that this particular person this particular woman not person this particular woman has actually reached her sell by date and really just needs to you know get get the hell out of there so one of the prominent themes to emerge from the study was the sense that women media professionals do have a sell by date determined by others and based on physical attributes and all the participants in, in my study had stories to tell ab about their, their experience of gendered ageism, from their contracts being uh, terminated or not renewed, to no longer being uh, asked to pitch for work, uh, to being told bluntly that they, they needed to have work done or else risk being replaced by a younger model. But there was also a recognition amongst, amongst participants that, that women who were in front of the camera uh, were much more vulnerable to this you know, unrelenting and, and socially pervasive uh, sense of beauty and age being kind of related and that they beauty, age and professionalism, competence, ability were somehow kind of all intertwined and, and actually coalesced to, to suggest that at some point, an older wo a, a woman becomes um, beyond the, uh, the appropriate age to continue in employment, but particularly kind of in front of the camera. I mean, the, the assumption that, that somehow both women and men are disgusted by the sight of, all, of an older woman is an idea, is a notion promoted regularly by managers and commissioners, women and men, and has resulted in terminated contracts and the contraction of work opportunities. But providing evidence of such a view is conspicuous, conspicuously lacking and indeed when audiences are asked explicitly about diversity on screen they in invariably say they would like to see more diversity and certainly more diversity in terms of women in, but women in relation to men but also older people on the other hand some women were kind of a little bit more, as it were, circumspect about the push and pull factors which affect kind of older women media professionals, um, questioning whether it's ageism or simply a, an understandable requirement to look good for the viewers. At the same time, these same women also acknowledged that perhaps they had internalized a set of values uh, which demand more of men of women than men in terms of um, how they look. So, so women kind of talked with varying degrees of hubris about the work that they ha had or hadn't had done to themselves in order to extend their shelf life in the ever more narrowed eyes of the 30-something producer 
something which um, within the academic discourse has been described as aesthetic labor. But of course, such efforts of, a, of, of, this, of such aesthetic labor are inevitably doomed to failure uh, because they're or oriented towards not looking old, but cannot stop the fact of being old. And this problem perception of the alleged fading beauty of the woman news anchor or presenter has been well documented by decades of research, including my own, in several countries, including the UK, US, Australia, described as the, the loss of pretty privilege, juxtaposed with the sparkle of fresher, younger talent in the minds of media managers uh, and media, you know, media executives and bosses. And most studies identify the problem of linking attractiveness with continuing employment with gendered aging being considered as a significant aspect of career jeopardy by women media professionals. Another emergent theme was around what we would call the mummy problem. Trying to achieve a satisfactory work-life balance is an aspiration of all of us, um, except those of us who are looking down the, the, the road of retirement, as I am myself. I'm just very, very happy to be looking, looking uh, at the end of, of that, of my working life. But trying to achieve that, that work-life balance is, is something which we all kind of want to uh, aspire to. And that is especially difficult, I think, for, for women who have care responsibilities, particularly those who have care responsibilities at exactly the same time when they might be vulnerable to, to issues around kind of gendered ageism, and they might be caring for both children and older parents. So sometimes that, that, again, that particular moment in, in women's kind of career history has this very awkward um, caring responsibility, at caring for people at both ends of the kind of age spectrum. And the, the kind of organizational structure of much of the media industry is predicated on more or less available all hours kind of ethos, which favors people. Uh, without care and responsibilities or people with significant home-based support who look remarkably like men. And one study of, of uh, women working in the Australian TV industry, nearly 100 women who took part, found that the majority of women who were in decision-making roles did not have children. And in a piece of work that I actually undertook, I don't know, years ago, five or six years ago, which was actually a European uh, project, which looked at 100 media organizations across Europe, we found exactly the same thing, that it's actually really difficult to actually get to the top of your um, career and also be someone who's caring for, for children or, or older or, or parents. And in, in indeed, amongst the recommendations by Britain's media regulator, Ofcom, in their 2019 report, they recommended extending flexible working arrangements to better accommodate care and responsibilities, as well as removing age restrictions on particular jobs and screens and schemes. Sorry. The problem with, with women who do decide to take, um, take flexible working, who do decide to kind of move to part time working or even just to take their full maternity leave, run the risk of being seen as less than fully committed to their careers or having limited availability, or viewed as likely to be regularly absent from work because of childcare duties and responsibilities. And so there was a reluctance to even apply for flexible working, um, simply because of how that might, they then might be seen uh, by, by their managers. And I think that this point about, there's, there's, a really, there's some really interesting work out there which looks at issues of hair and, and grey hair. And I think what, what's interesting to me is I see, you know, some of my students actually are affecting grey hair as, as, a, as a kind of image choice. And, but I think that, you know, as Maggie is saying, and as, as many of us would say, we know that there are different, you know, representational norms for women and men. And the question is, you know, why, why, these, thing, why these things matter? Now another, another theme that, that uh, was consistently mentioned was what I've called the experience paradox. And it's, it's kind of 
it's easy to appreciate perhaps how annoying it is for younger people to hear older people reminiscing fondly about the good old days when the media industry has developed technological innovation at such a pace that surely these are the good old days, that these are the days which we should be embracing. But then, you know, I would argue, many people would argue that, that skills such as storytelling or interviewing are independent of technology and actually improve with experience. However, the significant changes in the industry which have been brought about by the digital revolution have prompted a hesitation amongst some women to re-enter the industry after a period of absence, particularly after years of, of child or elder care. And this reticence has resulted in many women deciding to take the freelance route with all its precarities, but this means that at least they can use the skills and experiences they have built up and choose which, which work to pitch for, opting for, opting to kind of balance flexibility with insecurity. However, as, as Gabby says, when she pitches for, sorry, I've got that wrong. When she pitches for a freelance opportunity, her CV only mentions recently completed work so as not to foreground her age. And again, I think this is just so interesting. I think, if, you know, in my own profession, experience actually does count for something. The idea of, of submitting CV, which is only, you know, it's only kind of talks about your more recent work. Well, no one within, within the academy would ever do that. Um, you know, we actually, we want to demonstrate how our, our career has developed and, and built on. So th this idea of actually never, never kind of putting your age and only kind of talking about your most recent work is really fascinating and interesting to me because it would not happen in, in my own profession. A number of women also mentioned how their experience and knowledge worked against them as a threat to younger colleagues in ways which did not seem to affect their older male colleagues. Where the incoming managers were young women, participants believed that the antipathy they, they've experienced could be because those women felt threatened by the greater experience of older women, which would contrast with their own more limited knowledge, or that they wanted to be the only woman on their team, kind of queen bee syndrome, or that they couldn't use their feminine charms uh, to get uh, what they wanted. Where managers were young men, Participants suggested that perhaps they preferred to work with people more like themselves or that they assumed that older women were not tech savvy or else they didn't want to be bossed around by their mums. So for women whose male line managers were more or less the same age, including men who had grown older alongside their aging women colleagues, they believed that these men recognize that they couldn't manipulate them with flattery or flirting uh, or play the avuncular boss or, or didn't want to work with someone who could be their wife or their ex. I think that uh, Eleanor Mills kind of just sums this up uh, quite well. And as, as many of you will know, she's had a particular experience um, over the last kind of two or three years of leaving uh, mainstream media and, and setting up uh, on her own, which I'll talk about right at, right at the end. I mean, as, as with Miriam O'Reilly, Donna Trainer, and countless others on leaving work, a number of participants have been replaced by, as it were, fresher talent, talented younger women. And while this can be partly explained by the misogynistic perception that older women have a professional sell-by date, sorry, my dog in the background. Um, other reasons, as, as um, Eleanor is suggesting, could, could include the, the greater malleability of younger, hungrier people, as well as their relatively lower employment costs, and the entirely unsubstantiated notion that younger staffers will attract a younger audience, which is something which many broadcasters seem to uh, seem to believe, again, based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. I mean, however, several women had subsequently been rehired by their old employer to plug the very experience gap which had been previously disdained because youth 
cannot replace experience. And in fact, some researchers argue that the current cohort of media professionals constitute a lost generation, precisely because there are so few experienced professionals around to guide, mentor, and support them. On the other hand, experience can be valued by colleagues when developing new projects. And having been maneuvered out of her presenting job in her 60s, Wendy took a voluntary redundancy. And in 2022, she was back presenting a new TV show, having been contacted by a former colleague who was setting it up and who said that he needed someone the public trusted and that she was such a person. This is, this is something about uh, of what she said. And again, several participants spoke enthusiastically about the relationship that they now have with younger people, both as professionals in the newsroom, but also as journalism educators. And I'm thinking about several of my own colleagues who teach journalism at, at my university, who really do feel that their experience is valued by, by, by students because not only are they talking the talk, but they walk the walk as well. And that actually, with, within a university context, is actually really important. But I want to return to the issue I started with uh, about women who take the, the, the bold step of speaking up and out about gendered ageism. And given the extent of gendered ageism, we, we might ask why more women don't pursue tribunal claims against their employers. But not only is it an extremely time consuming and costly process, even with union representation, but there are also issues as, of what we might call self-preservation, which women weigh up in deciding or not to even make a complaint about discrimination, let alone start a formal grievance, particularly if they want to stay in their current employment or take, another, take up another job in the same industry. So, Several women made clear that when they had decided to take action, their managers made it very difficult to proceed, described by one participant as a process which was, quote, horrible and turned personal and nasty, unquote. However, a few participants in my study have taken out uh, tribunal cases uh, or legal cases in the, in the case of the US, mostly settling before their cases were heard strongly suggesting that their cases had merit and would have been successful had they proceeded. But there's a harsh part, price to pay for taking such action, as we saw from the, the quote from Miriam O'Reilly, especially for women in their 40s and 50s who still have decades of working life left and for whom early retirement isn't a viable option because claiming a virtuous victory doesn't pay the mortgage. I'm thinking here particularly about two women who I interviewed. So when Demetria Kaladimos's contract was expired on the 31st of December 2017 and was not renewed, a courier arrived at her house the following day, New Year's Day, uh, from her local, her hitherto um, TV station employer, informing her that she was not allowed to work as a broadcaster anywhere locally. She subsequently filed a lawsuit. She, I think she was in her 40s at that point. Um, she subsequently filed a lawsuit against the station's parent company on the grounds of sexism and ageism, which she eventually settled out of court in 2020. However, as she now ruefully acknowledges, her age proved to be a significant barrier to what she initially thought would be an easy breeze back into employment, given her experience and high audience of ratings and she'd worked for her um, station for 30 odd years prior to that. This, this loss of professional identity on leaving the profession which had sustained someone from their, for their entire working life was something that a number of, of women talked about really poignantly and sadly. And Eleanor Mills has talked about this in particular and said that it felt like she was in a period of mourning uh, after she left the, the Sunday Times for the death of what she was, uh, that is a journalist. And she says after, the, after news of her own so-called redundancy, 
uh, began circulating amongst her journalist peers. She was inundated with messages from friends and colleagues who fondly remembered particularly impactful pieces that she'd written, reminding her of how good a journalist she was. This was this was bittersweet because of those. Sorry, that was my two minutes. This was was uh, particularly um, bittersweet because although it meant that she kind of felt validated as a professional and a human being, it was nonetheless, in her words, like reading your obituary over and over again. This feeling of loss and indeed erasure reflects findings from other studies. Uh, for example, one study with um, 300 participants who'd also lost their journalism job, including some who had subsequently re-entered the news industry, found that the majority reported experiencing negative feelings on leaving, including depression. And other participants in my study talked about coping with a life kind of deprived of regular routines, job satisfaction and peer affirmation. So after this kind of somewhat gloomy analysis, I'd like to end the presentation on a positive note. Some of the women I spoke to while feeling seriously aggrieved and battered by their experience, have decided to develop second careers in the media, pivoting in, in different directions. And one example is, is Eleanor Mills, who set up at noon, uh, primarily an online space, um, which, which aims to, to do this. And I think it's, it's a really interesting um, kind of concept and it's interesting initiative. She, it's been going for a, for a year or two. And you know, I would really urge anyone who's who, who'd like who's who's interested in these issues to to go on the website uh, on her website on the Noon website and just have a, a look around and see what she's up to. She's she's doing some really brilliant things as well as kind of producing a regular newsletter, which she calls, as you can see here, the Queenager, as a kind of pun on the teenager that we actually you know we are women you know women in in our prime we are the we are queens. And I suppose that after, for, for me, after more than half a century of equality legislation in the UK and elsewhere, it's rather disappointing to see that older women continue to be moved out of front of camera uh, roles as anchors and presenters or lose work as actors or are marginalised in their newsrooms when they're perceived to have reached their sell by date. And lined up behind every 50, 60 or even 70 something woman who has managed to hang on to their jobs are thousands of women who have crashed and burned at the hands of their, their managers, often young, often male, though not always. Not because of a sudden loss of professionalism, experience, competence, expertise or even audience pulling power, but because they are deemed to no longer look the part. But it's heartening to see initiatives such as, as, as Noon flourishing and providing older women with positive support and validation of all that they are and all that they have to offer. And we just now need the, the broader media industry to follow suit. And thank you, onwards and upwards. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Karen, for ending on a positive note after such a litany of really shocking situations. I'm going to open it up now to questions from our members. Um, it's pretty obvious there's a lot of work for the NUJ, NUJ to do and follow up from this workshop. Uh, I'd like to start with a, let, um, a question from Nicoletta. Uh, who's our ageism lead on the 60 plus council. And then if you would just put your hands up if you have any questions and or put them in the chat, please. So uh, Nicoletta, can we have your question, please? Hello, thank you, Jenny. And thank you very much, Professor Ross. So much of what you mentioned, we have an inkling of, but we don't have hard evidence. And this is one of the difficulties in tackling ageism and sexism. There's plenty of anecdotal evidence from colleagues uh, um, and people in, in our industry and outside. 
but for you to actually hone in on the actual evidence and collect it is just so useful. I just want to ask you something that you mentioned quite early on. You said that people brought cases on the grounds of ageism and sexism, but it was mostly the ageism that was upheld rather than both together. And as we know, there's an intersection between different isms. I just wondered what you thought about that, what the reasons for that were. I think, thank, thank you, Nicola. It's an interesting uh, question. And I think that for me, well, well it's, can, it, can only, it can only be kind of speculation, but it seems to me that one of the reasons why it's, as it were, easier to get ageism accepted is because it's it's more obvious in terms of you know you can see what you can see a woman's age you know a woman is is such is an age and it's much easier I think to actually say if you just think about Miriam O'Reilly's case that was in some ways easier for her to get to get the kind of ageism claim because for example John Craven uh, was an older person his you know his job wasn't kind of terminated so I think there was a kind of direct comparison whereas I think actually sexism it seems to me is much more difficult to um to demonstrate that you know, so I think that I don't think it's necessarily that it's it's awkward or difficult legislatively but I think it's more difficult to prove sexism because we know you know decades of research we talking about well it's just banter it's just locker room talk there are so many ways to dismiss allegations of sexism um it's much easier as i said i think to actually demonstrate if you can do a, a comparison between a woman and a man of a say, the same age and a woman gets treated differently i think that you can then talk talk about kind of ageism i mean clearly it's still gendered you know the ageism is still gendered but i think that maybe it's I don't know, it, it just seems easier to prove if you've got something concrete like an actual age rather than something which can be seen as merely experienced or merely felt but not intended. It would be my speculation. I can see there. I haven't listened to that. I can see there. That's all right, Karen. Um, I think Derek Forrest had a question he wanted to raise and then um, Anne Galpin. Do you want to take yourself off mute, Derek? Uh, yes, Karen. Uh, thanks. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I say, as a comment, really, the fact that the TV, older male TV journalists like John Snow and John Simpson are much admired adds strength to your case. I and mean, these, th these journalists are lauded. You know, and the, the, they're held as great examples, as I say, while for women, it's very obvious, it's, it's an opposite, it's an opposite thing. And another thing was the question is, it's only a guess, but what percentage of gendered ageism, although is subconscious, although that's no excuse, as opposed to deliberate, do you think this is something that's been ingrained over decades and, and the women are victim of this, We're victims of this? <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. I mean, but I, I guess that there is something about you know older women are disavowed in ways which older men aren't. It, not just in the media, but it, I, you know, I've I've done other kind of projects uh, with other, you know, with looking at women in news more generally in in terms of representation. Women just aren't seen as as serious or as you know professional. But having said that, there are still plenty of women around. You know, just listening to Lise Dissel, you know, Jenny Murray only very very recently uh, retired. So it's, it's not that there aren't women, older women presenters or older women journalists who are revered, who are respected. But I think that though they are the ones who survive for you know whatever reason. But I think that the problem is that there are too many older women who are seen by other people. I mean, I think that the issue about media managers saying no one wants to look at, you know, no one wants to look at someone with wrinkles, which of course is complete nonsense because, you know, all due respect, Derek, I mean, you're not exactly wrinkle free. 
you know, so no. it's not like men are wrinkle free. It's just that somehow there is this perception that a woman with wrinkles is somehow just more, it, it is no longer attractive to an audience. The irony of all this, of course, if we, th if we think about mainstream media, is we think about who's the audience for mainstream media? Well, the audience are older people. You know, because younger people don't give, a, don't give a toss about kind of mainstream media. They're just on, they just get all their news from TikTok or from Instagram. So the, the idea of, of somehow that the, the audience who are, you know, the perception of the audience is actually put off by the, by the sight of an older oh. woman is just, is, you know, is, is a, a nonsense and B is actually shooting them, you know, media organisations in the foot because they're actually risking alienating the very audience which is actually is their bread and butter but i think there is a there's a cultural issue which um, has been here like forever in, in terms of just sexism you know straightforward sexism if you add in age to that equation then you get gendered ageism thank you thanks karen um and and galpin you had a question Hi, Karen. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, did you collect any data, any sort of intersectional data or look at intersectional disadvantage when you were doing your research? For example, um, with was there a greater disadvantage among disabled 60 plus women journalists and and or black 60 plus women journalists? And then sort of also related, not put in the text but another query was did you look at the differences between in front journal is sort of radio and print was the discrimination lower in radio and print than it was um as news anchors and such so, sorry i'm not very clear but. no i know i get it well to answer your first question your inter intersectional question um i didn't i haven't kind of discussed that because this was a self-selecting um sample and I didn't interview anyone. Um, I, in fact, that, that's true. I interviewed a, a couple of uh, women of colour um, who did talk about their particular um, experiences as being exaggerated by issues around exactly the intersectional. If you're kind of black and a woman and an older woman, you know, you actually have these kind of triple disadvantages. I'm sorry, I just need to get the dog off my lap. Um, so there was those those triple disadvantages, which occur, I'm, I you know would occur just as much in the media as basically any any other profession. Um, I did actually, who's on this call, I did actually interview Natasha Hurst, um, who did talk uh, to just you know did, did talk about kind of issues around disability. But I can't, I haven't really mentioned that because the sample it was was too tiny to kind of make any make any kind of inference um, around those 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 other kind of attributes but it kind of makes sense that we know that the, the more protected characteristics you display the the more multiple are the disadvantages I mean that's sadly that is a reality you know that, that women you know women experience if they've got those kind of multiple um, characteristics. What's your, what's your what was your second question? Sorry, that was. Did you did was and you may have said it. And I may have oh, missed yes, about it. different about different sectors. Yeah. Um, no, again, I didn't. Um, I don't think I. I think I might have interviewed one radio journalist. Um, I think most of the women who I kind of interviewed were from the from print, but of course that's actually nowadays can't even talk about you know is it radio or is it print or you know is it digital because of the kind of multi-platform nature and I think that that's something which many women did talk about that the there were different you know, as they're kind of moving it much more into the digital space that they are the disadvantages are that they are seen as not competent in those areas and sometimes they don't feel competent themselves to kind of engage in that in that process in a way that is actually quite di different, I suspect, from how older men might just think that they can do, you know, pretty much anything at any time. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, we've got a few hands up. Could I go first to Jenny Vaughan and then Sarah Lewis, please? Thank you. 
Hi, I, I want to make two points, but I think they are related. Um, in the area that I'm in, which has been <clears throat> for a long time, um, editing and writing often for young people, I think the feeling, I, I mean, I lost a, a massive contract several years ago and never really picked up since. But I have a feeling that there's, there's a, an assumption that young the older people don't have new ideas. Um, my experience in looking at what young people are doing is that they have old ideas, but they don't know their old ideas. So they think they're new ideas, um, which is kind of depressing. But the other thing that I find, and this may just be me because I may just be a bit feeble, but I think that constantly being pushed back, you do lose confidence and you start thinking in the end, oh, hell, I can't be bothered with it, you know? Jenny, that, those were statements. Did you actually have a question? Well, I think I wondered how much um, Karen feels that the loss of confidence is, is an issue um, with young people, well, older people, because they have been spurned so often or feel as if they're going to be spurned and feel that the general atmosphere that um, militates against older women especially is just not something they can any longer cope with. I mean, just to answer that that question kind of directly, Jenny, I, I think that the, the the lack of confidence tended to come for for women who were trying to kind of re-enter the kind of job market yeah. after you know after a period of outside. I don't think I, I didn't interview anyone who actually felt who themselves felt lacking in confidence. I think mu much of the the experience is actually being disdained. I mean, being told that they were no longer uh, appropriate that somehow that not that they had lost that they had lost competence but that no no I, I I meant loss of confidence in terms of continuing to look for work because they know it's a hiding to nothing yeah there was definitely there was definitely a sense of that particularly people you know for women who had who had been booted out of their uh, their, their jobs there was absolutely I think that the issue about the lock, lack of confidence that came after multiple rejections yeah. having had 30 you know 20 30 years of experience in in whatever their industry was to find that they weren't even getting interviews you know let, let alone the actual job I mean that's what you know a number of women talked about that's actually absolutely not their confidence for going for yet and setting themselves for yet more rejection and therefore actually thinking yeah, that, oh, well, that's what I meant uh, yeah, you know what? I'm I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to take early retirement, or I'm going to try and retrain, which I think is the the whole point about the uh, Eleanor Mills's uh, noon website of actually trying to to encourage women to think differently about themselves and what they have to offer. Maybe not, you know, it, sad though it is, not think that they can actually develop another, you know, another media career, but to do something different. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Sarah Lewis, would you like to come in? Hi, um, I'm Vice Chair of the Equality Council. And so my question is kind of um, what uh, could or should the NUJ uh, do to sort of combat this? I mean, should we have um, sort of um, awareness raising amongst uh, the media managers, some of which, uh, you know, some of the people doing this are our, our members. So what more could we be doing? Maybe guidance? I, and uh, particularly the Equality Council and 60 Plus Council. That's probably that's probably a question directed to Jenny Sims. Um, but I, I mean, I do think, you know, I'd love to think that that uh, awareness raising would work. I'd love to to imagine that, you know, if only media managers realised what the what was happening, they'd change their practices. I just don't believe that for a minute. I mean, I think it's it's coming back to Derek's point, which is about how conscious or unconscious are these biases? You know, when we look at, you know, in my own profession, I'm sure with, with uh, your profession as well, we can do, we can encourage people to go on unconscious bias training. But the bias is anything but, but unconscious. It's, that training is such a misnomer because actually the, the, the bias is completely um, conscious. I think that we have to kind of find ways to make, you know, to, appeal to the bottom line because the ethical moral and moral questions have never they, they don't kind of result in anything I think we have to kind of hit people where it matters in terms of audience share with ratings I think the more that we can kind of demonstrate how 
audiences want to see a diversity in you know, both in front and behind the camera, want to see these diverse perspectives. If we can actually encourage you know, the media industry to recognize its, its failings, its own failings in terms of the bottom line, I think that would push things forward. If it's anyone uh, watched the ITV uh, interview with uh, uh, Harry last night, uh, he himself was talking about his own unconscious bias, and I presume he's had some training into um, his current behaviour. Um, maybe this is something uh, the NUJ should, uh, training should be looking at. Um, can I just ask Natasha Hurst to come in, because we have been talking about uh, what the NUJ can do. And uh, Karen is quite right, it is something for us. Um, so before we have one more question, Natasha, have you got any suggestions? Um, thank you, Jenny. That, that's a big ask of me. Um, it's uh, It's been um, a really excellent discussion and it has, um, I think, in some ways, um, the points that Karen just made are quite important in that how do we demonstrate to employers what is in their best interest? It is not in their best interest to be booting older women out of their jobs with some you know misconception that this is what the audience wants so you know how do we find ways of gathering evidence and effectively lobbying employers um earlier was talked about mentoring if we if we don't have experienced people in the workplace how do we then mentor new younger journalists who are coming through so that they can do their job as well as they can um so so i think it's it's where do we get the evidence from um uh to to build strong arguments to employers um to, to just realize this it's in their best interest to to keep older women in the workplace uh, thank you natasha um andy can you see any more hands up in the yeah chat i mean I in terms see? of questions or comments um kim kim thomas i think you had something to say Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, all, all, all I wanted to say really was just sort of my general perception of the media, you know, having, I mean, I've been a journalist now for about more than 20 years, but I have worked in other industries as well. And it just seems to me that the media in general is quite a brutal industry, you know, I mean, pe people can just suddenly get dropped, particularly if you're a freelancer, you know, you can quite often be treated very badly. And there's like, it seems to me there's a general perception that it's okay to treat people with kind of casual contempt in the media in the way that you probably wouldn't get so much in other industries. And I just think that therefore, you know, the sexism then just becomes part of that. You know, it's just kind of taken for granted that this is the way we treat people. And if, you know, if we don't like somebody because she's a bit too old now or she doesn't look as attractive, then, yeah, let's just get rid of her. And I, I don't know if that's, you know, that's just my own perception or whether that's something you you spotted as well Karen that's a really interesting point Kim I mean as you were talking I was just thinking about you know as, as a kind of avid Radio 4 um, listener I'm always somewhat kind of perplexed surprised horrified at the, the line of questioning the aggressive nature of, of questioning on on many kind of radio shows I think that you know for people like John Humphreys, I just remember thinking every time he came on the radio, I had to turn it off because I got so irritated with his relentless, rude kind of style of, of interviewing. And I think that there is something, I don't know, that, that, that somehow it's seen as, as professionalism to actually just ask, you know, the, as it were, the hard question. But sometimes the nature of the, the orientation of questioning is so hostile or so combative that. It, I think it just turns people off. I'm not saying that only men do that because there are, you know, there are some women who do that as well. But I think that your idea of of just being you know, is is it part of the norm to kind of be rude? I think that we do see some pretty explicit examples of that. And so maybe the whole idea of kind of sexism and ageism and gendered ageism or racism or homophobia somehow they these it's kind of there's a license which you know journalists or broadcasters give to themselves to actually ask you know the so-called hard question which is kind of couched in in terms of professionalism but actually is often simply you know, rude 
or isms. Uh, can I allow another man to speak? Chris Frost, would you like to come in here? I see something in the chat from you. Chris yes, Frost? Th th thanks, Jenny. I mean, it, it's just something that occurs to me listening to the discussion and, and the way it's gone uh, about the possibility of some kind of re reverse effect. If, if women are being excluded uh, at the older age because of the wrinkles or because of the way they look, uh, and younger women are preferred because of the way they look. Are men where perhaps looks are, are less important being affected the other way in that older men, John Humphreys has been mentioned, I make no particular comments about him and the way he looks, but are, are older men considered much better, more experienced, able to do the job better, and therefore younger men perhaps lose out uh, in the opposite way. It's just a thought that crossed my mind and I wondered if Karen had any any views on that. And well, good to see you, Karen, by the way. Yeah, and I was just going to say, yes, hi, hi, hi Chris, good to see you again. Um, well, I think that in some ways, I mean, many younger men would, many men would say that they are casualties of, you know, of this push toward this, this feminist agenda. You know, it's, it's really difficult now for men to get jobs because, you know, people are thinking about you know, equality and, and recruiting women. So I, th I think there's always that kind of, pushback I mean I don't I can't answer that question because I didn't actually kind of talk to to, to younger men but I I suspect I just don't think that that I don't think it works in that way um and unfortunately um well fortunately perhaps for, for you know, we talk about younger men so I don't I don't think men, younger men are casualties of the reference which we afford to older men in a way that works with women I just I just don't think it, it you know, society doesn't work like that, as as you well know. So maybe that's just a provocation on your part. Oh, well, I think we are nearly out of time, but um, I it looks to me as though, Karen, we might have um, fed you some ideas for some further research here today. And if, uh, you know, keep in touch with us and uh, with the 60 Plus Council. And if we can help you again with any further research, we'd love to do so. Um, just to tell everyone, today that 60 plus council is putting a motion forward to the delegates meeting about combating ageist uh, discrimination so look out for that one and i hope you'll support us um so it just leaves me to say thank you to everyone uh, for attending i hope you take away something useful from it um we particularly like ideas from you to the 60 plus council to senior reporters on your comments and any ideas that we can feed back into um you know our campaign on generally on ageism um, of older people um so we look forward to hearing from you um and ideas perhaps for future workshops and anything else can so i just can i just here. can i just butt in there jenny i just i put in the chat that uh we won't get you know we won't get to to answer all the questions today but if anyone is interested in the work i've been doing that i've just put my email in the chat so if anyone can just now kind of zip up to the top or just find me at newcastle university you can you can find me there very happy to talk with anyone to share my research if that, that would be useful for you know for campaigning purposes i mean i'd already sent the draft um project report to jenny so you, you have that but very happy to talk to uh, you know to, to share my ideas with anyone else outside this meeting, which has been uh, great. It's been the first outing of this of presenting the research. So thanks very much, and and thanks again for those of you who are you know, making nice comments in in the in the chat. Thank, and thanks for inviting me, Jenny. It's been a really a, a pleasure to talk to everyone. Thank you again, Karen. It's been really thought provoking. Thank you, and thank you everyone. <laughs>